Hi, my name is Adam Robles, and I wanted to uh, continue with my review of the Urban Perspectives video um, responding to Dr. James White. And uh, I wanted to start this video uh, right where we left off. Uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to sort of explain why I'm interested in this so much and why I care about this so much. Um, you know, I, as a, as a minority, a Hispanic, Latino, whatever you want to call it, um, I feel like that there's a lot of time wasted um, worrying about and planning against uh, this idea of white supremacy and rampant sort of racism, systemic racism that I don't think actually exists. Um, and so if it doesn't exist, if, if, if I'm right, all of the time that people spend thinking about it um, and arguing for, uh, arguing against it and all of that, all of that time is wasted time. And so uh, I think that um, as a minority who's kind of already behind the eight ball, you know, we don't have uh, quite as much capital uh, as um, the majority culture does. Um, you know, white people have been around uh, in the United States, you know, owning property and building businesses for a lot longer than Hispanics have. Um, and black people like likewise are in a similar sort of situation where they're behind the eight ball. And so my, my thing is I want black and brown people to be as competitive as possible. Uh, and I think that there are lots of things that we can do um, to be uh, competitive uh, with, um, you know, white people who have a lot more capital and who have um, a lot more established uh, institutions and things like that. And so that's what I want to see people spending time talking about and planning for. And, 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 and um, I think that this whole idea of this white supremacist boogeyman that uh, is out there really only holds us back. Um, and so that's why I care about this. I think that, um, you know, these two brothers in this video, um, they're sincere. I think that they have the, the right motivations. Um, but I think they're, they're just wrong about a lot of their uh, conclusions. And so because of that, they end up wasting a lot of time and, um, you know, people who share their, their viewpoints end up wasting a lot of time that, that could be otherwise spent becoming more competitive. Uh, and that's kind of what I, that's my whole point. That's why I care about this. I think that the, uh, the Bible gives uh, everyone principles, not only um, Hispanics and Blacks, but also white people, principles that we can apply to their lives that um, help your situation, that puts you in a uh, a situation where you can be competitive and you can have success, um, you know, not only financially, but just, you know, as a culture, as a family. And so that's why, that's why I care about this. Um, and so I hope that you kind of can hear that um, coming through in some of my responses to this. So let's pick up right where we left off uh, in the video. This is right around minute 38. And us, we, we enter in immediately go to authority. Well, if he hadn't have been doing the crime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that's that's language of authority. And I'm not saying that, that we throw, because you got to have both right, of absolutely. them working together. You you see... Yes, definitely. Uh, I'm glad to see that he uh, makes the point, Pastor James White there makes the point that you cannot throw away um, authority and also personal responsibility too. See, here's the thing. I think... You know, we in the last video we t we talked a little bit about some of the specific situations that um, Pastor James White brings up. You know, brings up Eric Garner, he brings up Michael Brown uh, and Trayvon Martin, um, and so that's the whole point, though. I think that we need to have this balance. And frankly, you know, these two pastors don't see the balance uh, when a lot of white evangelicals talk about this issue. And to be perfectly honest, I don't see the balance when these two brothers talk about the issue because. You know, while you know, while someone who responds, "Hey, you know, you shouldn't have done the crime, and so you paid for it with your life," that's a stupid response, right? Because, um, you know, s s selling Lucy cigarettes is not a good reason to be having an interaction with a cop, right? Um, and you know, strong arm robbery, you know, this is what Michael Brown was doing or had done rather. Um, that's not a good reason to die. Um, so nobody should say that, that, you know, he shouldn't have done that if he didn't want to die. Um, but at the same time, you, you need to consider the, I, the fact that this was a criminal, right? This was someone who had just done a crime. And so potentially there could have been some circumstances in that police interaction that led to, um, what happened, uh, to the, to, to Michael Brown being shot. 
I'm not saying that, you know, strong arm robbery deserves death because it doesn't objectively the bible doesn't say that robbery the death the, the death penalty is valid for robbery um but at the same time you, you it, it's it's something to consider because right now it's just you know a couple people's word versus a couple people's word and we need to sort of weigh the evidence is there enough evidence to say that was a murder uh, i don't think so uh, i don't think a jury thought so so you know we, we need balance here yeah, you know, that's a stupid reason to say he should have, Michael Brown shouldn't have died for his crime, but it is something to consider when determining whether or not a crime happened, right? And so we need to have that balance on both sides. But I appreciate the pastor mentioning that because I agree. Read this with Jesus. Jesus, again, he, he has authority, but he has vulnerability. Yeah. John 13. Yeah. He doesn't lose his authority. But he moves to a place of vulnerability. John 13, he takes off his garment, yeah. he puts on a towel. He, exactly. Even in the act of doing that yeah. with his disciples, he's very vulnerable here to unclothe himself, put on a towel. So we go to washing the feet, but even the very act, Jesus is moving from authority to vulnerability. And then Jesus is engaging his disciples who would deny him, who would betray him. And he's washing feet. And what does he tell us? You ought to wash one another's feet. Do what do we do rather than us washing the feet of Mike Brown, rather than us washing the feet of those who are saying, look, we have no authority of those in black. We end up trying to place more authority yeah. rather than going in and serving. And what does the yeah. serving look like for many times for us who are whites? And, and white Christians, is it means I'm willing to be vulnerable to hear without defense. Hey. Um, it's interesting, right? So um, he talks about being willing to sort of wash the feet of people who are vulnerable. He even says um, to wash the feet of Mike Brown. Um, and I wish he would have explained what he meant by that because I don't, I don't, I'm not really sure what he means by that um, because Jesus did serve people and, um, um, and love people who would, would betray him, right? Who would do him wrong. You know, Jesus washes the feet of these disciples who would deny him, who would do him dirty, right? So um, that does happen. We need to, to recognize that. But one thing he never does, not even for an instant, is lower his standard, right? So whether or not it's his friend, whether or not it's somebody vulnerable, whether or not it's somebody in power, his standard is holiness. And so what doesn't matter who is the one sinning, he never lowers his standard. And so when we approach the Mike Brown situation, we need to have evidence, two or three witnesses, you know, and, and that's, that's, you know, in my opinion, that's not, um, saying you need to have two or three eyewitnesses to every event to, before you can establish the truth. I think rather that's establishing a principle that you need to have uh, solid evidence. You need to have corroborating evidence that a crime happened before you can go and execute judgment, right? And so uh, unless you're going to say that there was specific evidence that said that a murder occurred in the Mike Brown situation um, and that there was no evidence to the contrary, that it wasn't a justified killing. Um, you know, a, you know, a jury tried the case and, and determined that that was not the case. And so um, unless you're going to say that, that it was a complete miscarriage of justice, that there was all this evidence and it was just ignored. And not only that, we also have evidence that it was a racist, a racially motivated killing. Um, I don't see how you can, you know, hold anyone accountable to say, you know, you just don't care about this. You just decided to ignore this. You weren't washing the feet of Michael Brown um, because, you know, on the one hand, we, we, you know, we would want to serve someone like Michael Brown. We would want to love them. But at the same, at the same time, we need to take after Jesus and we do not lower our standard um, of responsibility, personal responsibility. We don't lower our standard of justice um, just because a, a, a group or a person is vulnerable, right? So, um, you know, it's an interesting kind of commentary and, and I think I agree with him to a point, but, um, I'm not sure if I agree with his complete application. Hey, I'm willing to listen to your tears, even though there may be some thoughts and ideas that may be wrong. 
I'm also glad to hear him say that because, um, yeah, I agree. You know, we we have to be willing to listen to someone's pain. Um, and I'm going to be reviewing an article that talks about, it's an article called um, Why White Churches are, are Hard for Black People. I think that's the title. And it's, it, was, it was put out by Nine Marks. And, um, you know, I don't agree with the, the article. I don't, I don't think it's a good article, right? So I, lo I love this video, but this article is an example of something that I think is completely unhelpful. And, but the point is that you want to read articles like that and you want to take them seriously and listen to their pain. But as the pastor said right there, even though knowing that some of their points, some of their arguments might not be correct. Um, pastor here says, seems to think that, that this is a problem with white evangelicals. I don't. Um, I never come across, you know, people, white people or otherwise that say, you know, I don't really want to hear you out. I don't even want to hear it. It was wrong. You know, I, I, I don't come across that. I, I do come across people who say, okay, I've, I've heard, but I don't agree. You say that there's this rampant uh, racism problem. I just don't agree. You, you say that a lot of people out there are white supremacists and it's just so common and it's subtle, but it's very common. I don't agree. I, I see very few white supremacists out there and they typically are pretty stupid. You know, they're the ones that dress up. They, they go LARPing. They look like, you know, ghosts in white sheets. You know, th this is not common, right? So I don't, I, I, I hear this brother, I do, but at the same time, you know, I don't see a whole lot of what he's talking about, where people are just unwilling to listen. Um, I see the opposite. I see people willing, being willing to listen, but not agreeing. I'm willing to engage, but not just from authority. If I got all the answers, here's why this happened. But we're willing to be vulnerable. That's well. that's, that's that's a brilliant response. You know, one one of the things that amazes me are the hermeneutical and exegetical gymnastics that evangelicals play when it comes to topics like this you know yes. you know him and others are uh he he did another video where he said it's it's hard uh to of uh, being a calvinist well calvinists go by the tulip model you know total depravity mm -hmm. unconditional election limited atonement ir irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints the t is total depravity total would mean all Right. right. So if if we embrace the concept and the biblical reality based on Genesis three of total depravity, why would we limit that total depravity can come out in the form of a white man in a blue uniform with a gun? We don't. We just simply don't. Um, you know, Pastor James or sorry, Dr. James White, the, the, the white James White. Um, he doesn't limit that in that way. He would not say that um, to, that that a that a police officer, a white police officer, um, couldn't be sinful in that way. He wouldn't say that. Um, but there's a difference between admitting that a white police officer could be racist or could um, display his depravity in that way, and then saying that he did. Right. So this is this is interesting because. It's almost like saying, well, if you believe in total depravity, then you have to believe every single claim of depravity that's out there. And that's not what total depravity says. Uh, and also, here's the other thing. Total depravity doesn't mean that people are as bad as they could be. Um, because um, Calvinists especially believe that God restrains evil all the time. So people aren't as bad as they could be, but um, every area of humanity, every area of, of, a, of a person's moral um, makeup is affected by sin. That doesn't mean that at any given time you're being as sinful as you possibly could be. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm not sure who he's making this point to, you know, Pastor James White, or I'm sorry, Dr. James White would not deny that it's possible that a white police officer um, could um, manifest sin in this way. But that's a very, you can't just go from he could be doing this to he's definitely doing it. We need to, we need to have evidence um, that this is the case. We can't just assume that it's the case. Um, so good point, I guess, but it, it, I don't know who it's a, really a point for. I don't know anyone who would argue that it's not possible for a white cop to be racist uh, or to act in this way. I don't know anyone who would say that. So i um, not really sure who that is an argument for. 
if we embrace this idea of total depravity, then we, we have to understand that police brutality, it's not the only issue, but it is an issue. And then it is an issue, but it's a very minor issue. So um, I think that, again, this is the whole point. You know, nobody denies that police brutality happens. Nobody denies that uh, it could be racially motivated. Nobody denies that police are perfect. See, I, I feel like I'm in a really good spot here be, to, to talk about this because in general, I don't support uh, American policing. I think that it is a lot of times overly oppressive. Um, there are a lot of laws that are out there that have nothing to do with public safety. They're just revenue generators and police officers are, you know, collecting on that. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a pro, you know, police officer person in general. Um, but, you know, again, this is this is the whole this is the whole argument. It does happen, but is it a rampant problem? It is it something that we need to spend all of this time, all of this money, all of this energy worrying about? And the statistics say that it isn't. Um, so if you spend all of your time worrying about something that is so unlikely to happen, um, the question is, whose problem is that? Right? Um, it, it it's not. It doesn't seem reasonable to me to worry about something that is very unlikely to happen to you. Um, but that's just me. Then even exegetically, when we look at Acts 16, it would appear that Paul was a victim of police brutality himself. Acts 16, 19, they don't find out later that he has dual citizenship after the slave girl is free and then her owners see that their, their chance of gain is gone. A crowd comes, and the Bible says the magistrates, which can be translated into police, <laughs> they join in beating Paul. Oof. Now, Pastor White, Paul's response wasn't, this isn't a gospel issue. <laughs> Paul's response right. was, when they right. tried to let him go silently, right. he said, no, you beat me publicly, and some of the police beat him, yes. and he demanded an apology. So why, why do you think, um, so that's scripture, yes. but why do you think we avoid even the biblical reality that the gospel is not social justice, but the outpouring of it. That, but that the gospel itself isn't social justice, but it's a message of justice to spiritually oppressed people whom by grace through faith are set free in Christ. Why do we want to label what the gospel sees as normative, and that's confronting injustice? Why do we label that liberal? Why yeah, um, I'll let the pastor respond to that question, but I'll tell you how I would respond. And um, my response is, he's right on. He's right on. One of the worst um, arguments against this kind of a presentation is, um, you, you can even go to the video on YouTube and you'll, you'll see this in the comments. A, lot, a number of people actually use this. And I think this is a horrible response. People say, this is not the main issue. This is not a gospel issue. People will say, we got to keep the main thing the main thing. Um, and I'm sorry, that, that's just a very shallow, very stupid response to this kind of a presentation. Because um, he's right. He's right on. You know, Paul doesn't say, oh, this is not important. This is not the gospel. So, you know, you beat me. It's all good. He doesn't say that. No, he actually talks about, you know, he demands justice. He demands an apology and all of that kind of thing. And I think that that's that's exactly right. And there's definitely application we can make to today. You know, we should pursue justice. We should pursue social justice. Um, and the reason why we should do it is because God cares about it. You know, God um, in in His law lays out what social justice looks like. He cares about it. He insists on it. He even punishes nations for not being just. So these are issues that Christians should care about. But the question is, what is social justice, right? Because I, of course, will, I will agree with, with the pastor um, on that point, but I will disagree with him on what, this, what social justice is, right? Because he's thinking that it's these issues of uh, racism and discrimination and things like that. And I don't think that those are really that big of a, I mean, I don't think those are big problems today. Um, so where they do exist, we would want to confront them, but... I think that a lot of places where these two brothers would say it exists, I don't think it actually exists. So um, if you are white, uh, or if even if you're not, and your response to a presentation like this is, you know, it's not, this is not a gospel issue. 
please stop using that argument. It's a dumb argument. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and so uh, let's listen to see how uh, Pastor James White responds. How do we politicize biblical realities? Pastor, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I almost would guarantee that even, even the way you use that passage of the Apostle Paul, there's some who will hear that and will say, whoa, wait a minute, you, you've made a connection there that I'm not sure in that time period that Paul would have made that connection. Whoa, wait a minute, you, you have taken that interpretation uh, of what Paul did, but the police system, the government, the structure in America is very different mm -hmm. than what happened at that time. So there's some who will hear that and say, I'm not sure you can make that kind of jump in interpretation. Now here's what's confusing. They would say that about you and your hermeneutic and your exegesis of that text and make that interpretation. But that same group of people refuse to really take a look and be honest about total depravity when it came to slaveholders. <laughs> they, that, that same group of people would question your interpretation. Yep. Yep. Will, will, will not admit that it was horrific yeah. that Jonathan Edwards was a slaveholder. Yeah. It was horrific that church fathers yeah. owned slaves. And they say, well, but no, they were a product of their times. And yeah. you got to be very... I, that's always... See, when we talk about total depravity, absolutely, if you really believe in total depravity, then we would be able to own the full scope of the impact of 200 years of seeing that a people group are not even human. And we would be able to look at people who we read, scholars, church fathers, reformers, etc., and look at them, even countries founding fathers and say, they literally thought that people were not human. They literally that, that we had the church that was silent because even when the slave trade ended in the early 1800s, the U.S. continued having more slaves than ever before because now they were breeding slaves. Right. Yeah, uh, I think that was well said. Um, I think that one one kind of quibble I would have with 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 his what we said there is you know. I, I don't want to, I don't know if we want to play this game of, you know, yeah, you don't like my interpretation, but then you, I don't like your interpretation. And so we're kind of even, the question isn't, you know, who's, who's, you know, got bad interpretations or not. The question is the interpretation themselves. Is it, is it correct? Is it a proper application? Um, so, you know, I, my opinion is that, that this brother's application of, of uh, what Paul did there is pretty good. I mean, I think we need to consider uh, what Paul did what, by appealing to the magistrate after being beaten by the police. Um, and we, we need to look at that and say, okay, well, what situations when we get accosted or when we get abused, uh, are we in a position to sort of, you know, you know, appeal to uh, uh, another civil governing authority? I think that some people would say you're never in a position to appeal to civil governing authorities. I think that's incorrect, you know? Um, so, you know, I, 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 I like what he said there. I mean, we need to be honest with the fact that, you know, some of our heroes of the faith, faith were wrong about things, right? I, I see a lot of this in reformed circles too. There's a idea that sort of the older, <laughs> the, um, the older a, a book is or a, a theologian is, um, the more correct that they were. So like anything new is looked at with suspicion. Um, and, I, you know, in some ways, that's a good principle. Sometimes if there's a new doctrine, right, um, you probably want to immediately be suspicious of it. You know, anything that's a new from a doctrine perspective is kind of like, all right, well, why has nobody thought of this before, right? But at the same time, um, we got to think of cultural context because there are cultural issues now that weren't around back then. And so there can be new applications and new insights of previous doctrines that, you um, that could come up. And so we want to embrace those. We want to, you know, be critical, be a Berean with it, but we shouldn't just look at something that's new as something that's suspicious or automatically wrong. Um, and that's, this is a common thing in reform circles, I think. So I think, you know, pastor's right on there.
But anyway, uh, I'm going to do one more video. There's a, a section at the end where uh, Pastor James White is speaking directly to black people. Um, but there are some applications that, that I can make, um, even if you're not black and you're listening to this, um, that I think are interesting. But uh, and, and the other thing, too, about this section is the, the last section. Uh, at first, when I first heard it, I hated it. I was like, oh, Pastor, why? Why are you saying this? This is awful. But I actually, I think I misunderstood him. Um, so I don't hate it anymore. I actually like it. Um, although there are some, um, there are some responses that I have to it. So anyway, uh, we'll see you in the next video. <clears throat>